Thank you for tuning in. This is a multi-platform broadcast of Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. This is an update of the Libro Tafigante the Caravan of Banned Books, this time to Austin, Texas. We are departing from two cities at least, Houston and San Antonio, on Friday, April 29th in the morning, and we'll be heading to Austin, Texas. Today, we'll be joined by some of our allies, both in Austin and in Houston. But if you do want to board one of those buses or join us on the caravan, you can go to LibroTraficante.com. I'm Tony Diaz at Libro Traficante. Happy to join you here live on Facebook, but also because it's multi-platform, we start at the Nuestra Palabra platforms. But then, as you know, you'll be watching this video on Fox26Houston.com. You'll be listening to this audio on 90.1 FM KPFT, your community station. I got to remind the listeners, do not forget that KPFT is listener-sponsored, nonprofit community radio. So if you can budget a donation to 90.1 FM, please visit kpft.org. Click on the tip jar and make a donation in the name of Nuestra Palabra, Latino Word is Having to Say, or our other program, Latino Politics and News. I'm Tony Diaz, Alibo Traficante. I want to introduce our friends today. Joining us from Austin, Texas, he is the director of the Bat Cave, and he's in, actually in the Batmobile, which will be smuggling banned books that they. Uh, <laughs> Richard Santos, hey, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for joining this caravan. No, thank you, Tony. Thanks for reaching out to us. We're really excited to play a part in this. Fantastic. And you are just titillating us with that that background there. I can just imagine all the fun we're going to have loading in with all these banned books in there. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And our dear friend, the Aki Houston, Texas, she's an Aztec danzante, visual artist, community organizer, Monica Villarreal. Monica, thank you for joining us also. Thanks for including me. And we're really excited that you're going to be not just part of the caravan, but we're so happy that you are the Nuestra Palabra Community Representative for City Council B. And also congratulations mm -hmm. on your organization receiving one of the BIPOC Arts Network Fund grants. So there's a lot to celebrate. We're also going to be spreading the word. So uh, again, congratulations for that. And you also mentioned you may have some ongoing interruptions a little bit. Should we mention that? Yes, I have a four-year-old son and he uh, may interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and mute whenever that happens. And we chatted back and forth. She's like, maybe I shouldn't go on. And I was like, no, you have to. Because not only are we in the Zoom hour, but these are real life issues. And yes, you are a, a leader, organizer. You work nine to five. You create mom. art. But a mom also. And people have to understand that all of us are juggling all that. But that's also what's good at the table. So we appreciate you making the time and uh, lo, lo que pase, pase. <laughs> you know, we'll be fine. He's already screaming for me right now. So. <laughs> I love it. And of course, we want to thank Roxana Guzman, who is our multi platform producer, and also Rodrigo Bravo, who produces our radio show and makes our audio sound amazing. And there's a whole other team behind the scenes, but also want to welcome you folks who will be supporting this new chapter of the Libre Traficante movement. So let's put this in the historical context. Ten years ago, right-wing legislators in Arizona banned Mexican-American studies, and our community came together. We pulled our community cultural capital together, and we united to overturn that racist law. I want to point something out, too. That's not my opinion. When the Arizona Supreme Court overturned that law, it said it was implemented with discriminatory animas and that certain politicians implemented that policy in order to gain power. I honestly thought we would only be marking those 10-year anniversaries, but now there's several additional bans. Um, and as we get to our first guest, um, and I want to give a longer introduction to his work. I will say this. I feel that Mexican American studies will not be directly banned ever again, mostly because our community united and schooled the folks that would silence us. However, 
because we're experts in this, not only did we study it at a grassroots level, we studied it at the legal level and the legislative level. It's clear that some of those same practices are in place with different details, but the intent is the same to get books out of the hands of our community. So we're going to, we've come up with a great way to make sure that our community continues to enjoy its literature. And part of that will be on Friday, April 29th, beginning with a press conference in front of the Latina Icons mural here in Houston, Texas, and also in the parking lot of the Guadalupe Cultural Life Center in San Antonio. We'll have buses leaving from Houston, San Antonio, all the way up to Austin. And we're going to be joined by one of our new friends and new allies in this cause. They've been doing a lot of work for a while. Um, we're going to put the logo on, on their flyer and everything. It is the Bat Cave. We're joined by Richard Santos. I do want to read his bio for many reasons. One, give credit where credit's due. But also, I think some of our viewers and listeners, they want to hear how to become community organizers, become writers, and work in these fields. So I, I know that when we share your bio, other people learn from it as well. So uh, Richard Santos is a novelist and executive director of Austin Bat Cave a nonprofit that provides creative writing workshops to students in underrepresented areas. That's a common theme that you'll be hearing a lot about today. He's a former high school English and social studies teacher. First of all, <laughs> hats off to that. And in a previous career, worked for some of the national top political campaigns, consulting firms, and labor unions, all of which involves community organizing as well, I might add. Trust me, published by Arte Publico Press right here in Houston, Texas, uh, was named one of the best debuts of 2020 by Crime Reads and was a finalist for the Writers League of Texas Novel Prize. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for all that you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tony, for having us. Thank you for including Austin back here. By all means. And of course, we're looking forward to driving around Austin in the Batmobile. <laughs> Um, people will be donating books that are banned or that our community should have access to. Tell us a little bit about Austin Bat Cave and the, what the Batmobile does when we're not working with you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Austin Bat Cave was founded in 2007, and we provide free or donation-based literary arts workshops in Title I schools to youth in underrepresented areas, like you said. So, you know, we'll, we'll provide after school classes for students or we'll work directly with partners like CASA or Out Youth or Breakthrough. We're, we will do programs in juvenile detention facilities when we're able to, because uh, we believe everyone's a writer. And our goal is to get in front of as many kids as possible and help them tell their stories. Uh, every year we publish an anthology of their work uh, our fourteenth is coming out this year. Uh, it's great, it's full of student poems and essays and op-eds, short stories, any anything you could imagine. It's in there, and some of it's really brilliant. Um, uh, well, that'll be out later in May. And so, yeah, this is the Batmobile. Um, this is my virtual background. Everybody loves a Batmobile. So we got this a few years ago with the goal of really doing a mobile program, specifically in Dell Valley, specifically in like far far eastern Travis County. Um, this is an area that's rapidly changing and the, the gentrification, the kind of like gaps in social status out there is huge. And so those schools out there were, were, are all for like any sort of extra help we could provide. During COVID, Batmobile did not go a lot of places, I got to be honest. But what we started to do last year is say like, okay, so we can't, you know, usually we would have just kids sit back there and they would write in their classes and it would be a, a really transformative experience for them. Uh, so we couldn't do that. But what we could do is take the bus to schools, take the bus to parks or community events and let kids come on board. We could give them some free books, some donated books, some of our own anthologies. Uh, we could just help kind of spark their imagination a little bit. And then, uh, and then go go back on our way. We were just at an event this weekend where we gave out a couple hundred books to all the families that came through. Uh, it's great. It's a wonderful, magical space. Really, kind of gets people's like imagination going. I love it. No, my my imagination's running wild. Mm -hmm. And so, so to let folks what know uh, some of the path that we'll take. If folks go to librotapicante.com, they can click on the page to get to a blog post where we are updating some of the events. And there's many 
Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. But we'll be driving our buses from both cities, uh, San Antonio and Houston, to uh, Palm Park. And I mentioned Palm Park because we need to remind folks that long ago in Austin, Texas, Mexican Americans could not use the Anglo Library. So our community then started, they didn't call it an underground library then, but it was. They started this underground library where Mexican American youth and family could go and use the books. We're going to convene there to launch the Libertad Fundante Underground Library in that area with La Peña to mark that history, but more than anything, to remind our community that we're resilient, but we have to make sure that our community has access to our books on our terms all the time and so that we're not at the whim of any administration. We started these underground libraries during the 2012 Libro Tafica the Caravan. Um, Richard, let me ask you this. Some people may think that, well, here, here are two Chicanos and here's a Chicana. They're educated. They have access to books. They may think that in this day and age, it's not a real issue that our youth are not getting their stories, their history, their culture handed to them in classrooms. Is that is that the case, or am I exaggerating? Yeah, I, I think there are probably lots of people who think it's not an issue anymore, or we're past that, or it's on the internet. They'll just they'll, they'll go to the internet. Kids love the internet. They'll find everything there. It just doesn't work that way, you know. Like uh, you you have to be proactive, whether that's a parent uh, in a bookstore or a library trying to figure out what to what to take. Uh, or you're an organization like all of ours trying to figure out what to do with your mission, uh, or, you're, or you're a teacher trying to figure out like what to do. Uh, I was an English teacher. You know, very, the state does not tell you what books to teach, but it's really hard as a teacher to kind of push back against that inertia in your campus of being like, oh, well, we've got 500 copies of this book. Let's just teach. Like, there you go. I'm teaching this book. Sometimes you gotta you gotta work a little bit harder. You gotta get some more titles donated, purchased at a discount, whatever it can be, and just put more work in front of students. They want to hear these stories. Like they they get it. They light up when they see stories that feature themselves. Uh, it really makes a huge difference. I love it. I'm gonna bring Monica in. I, I do want to mention one thing about uh, the books that will be donated. Um, sometimes when people hear about the underground library, they think it's very formal. It's not. It's very organic. Um, not all the books will be banned. And Dr. Antonia Castaneda, a Chicana icon from San Antonio, not only will she be in the caravan, she's donating uh, a ton of her books as well from her own library. So just like you're mentioning, how do teachers get those books? These books then have passed through the filter of a Chicana icon who's got Ivy League uh, experience and training, but also deep from the community. That's what we want our youth, our families to have access to. And from the Houston side, we'll be launching from um, Yolanda Black Navarro Middle School, which has a Latina icons mural. And we're naming five emerging Latina icons who will convene with us uh, in the morning before the bus launches, talking about those icons, how they influence them, but all, more than anything, why our history and culture matters. One of those icons is Monica, she's emerging icon. And you've really taken a big leadership role in our community. Um, tell folks about uh, your organization first, and then I want to touch on why you think it's so important that our history and culture permeate not just the schools, but our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So um, just to speak a little bit about my uh, the work that I do here in Houston, mm -hmm. I am a... Um, I do Danza Azteca and I'm a part of Danza Azteca Tashcayolo. Um, our group have been doing work here over 15 years in the East East and Second Ward, uh, Segundo Barrio area and um, in Eastwood Park. Um, and we have a yearly ceremony uh, really to commemorate uh, the, the resistance of Tenochtitlan. And I don't know, even, even though um, the resistance you know, occurred in Mexico, um, we were very much affected by it. And so we do that as a public event and invite the community to come and we read the mandato. And the mandato was uh, written out or, or spoken out by our Tlatuani uh, Cuauhtémoc. And uh, within reading that, it really just says that there are a lot of 
in the, um, I guess, 500 years ago, 501 to be uh, exact. Uh, we just are, this year is going to be five, it's going to mark 501 years of the resistance. Um, we were told by uh, the Tatuani uh, of uh, the Aztec um, tribe that we will have to, at one point, hide our um, uh, most prized possessions, which is our books and our knowledge, our um, all of the things that are sacred to us, as well as our children in our homes, um, because uh, we would be per persecuted for the things that we know, for the things that we um, that that uh, would be a threat to another um, civilization. And so at this point now, at this age, we are now emerging from that and uh, becoming a peoples that are not just um, uh, saying that we have something to say now, but that we have been having something to say. And a lot of those things were ruined at a point, at a certain point. And we are now reconquering uh, in a sense, though, those old knowledge, those old ways of doing things, um, our old libraries, our old, our, even our our languages. Sorry, but they can hear my son. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of the work that the groundwork that we do here in Houston around even going into the schools and edu uh, educating the kids around their their cultura which you can just see it in their faces in their eyes how they brighten up when they learn about their history um that's powerful no i love that your son is <laughs> is chiming in but i also want to let people know i've seen you um present some of this historical knowledge in your regalia um in fact lulac had a special town hall on um, here in Houston, we want to change the city council districts where they're all single member districts. And you came uh, right before we started and you brought your four-year-old son. So your son is a performer. I think he wants his own airtime, <laughs> mas que nada. Um, but you, you have a lot of grace, but let's remind people of that. You are recapitulated knowledge. Perhaps these bands then are not one-shot deals. Right now, we are fighting to recognize the erasure of the erasure of our history, which goes back 10 years when Arizona banned Mexican-American studies. It goes back to when Mexican-Americans could not use the Anglo Library. And you just reminded our, our listeners and viewers that 500 years ago, there were pirates from Spain who came to Abya Yala and stole the land. And the Mexica governance had to hand over governance of the people in the land. And part of the cost of that was that our books, our art, our libraries were burned. And so, th so this is, this seems to be cyclical. That was essentially the first step was to burn all our books, to uh, destroy our temples, destroy the, our um, places of learning. Um, and, you know, it's known that that's like the first step in order to get rid of a certain civilization or get rid of um, or start anew. And, and I want to mention, folks, these are historical facts. They've been studied different ways in history. Um, but I just want to put that on the table in a larger context. At the same time, we want to stare that history right in the eye and grow because I think your organization then has recapitulated a lot of that history and you share it in a beautiful way. You have free classes here in Houston, you're studying community gardens and here's the next era. So so what what do what murals like the like five Latina icons represent to you? And what do your free workshops of Aztec Danza in Houston Parks, what does that mean to you and what do you think it symbolizes in this moment to spread history and culture to our community so i just wanted to mention something really quickly because what, you mommy? hold on baby just can you take a break because i'm going to interview okay thank want, you I go play in your to... can you go play in your room really quickly I wanted to tell you. okay well what i was saying um what i was mentioning is that earlier you had said that um, our American studies um, programs probably won't be in, in threat anymore because of the, the organizing that we're doing. Um, but just now, uh, I have a, a friend who is going to 
the um, Arizona University and his program, his doctoral program is being under threat right now. Um, and he's in the American, ah! stu American uh, ah! I'm sorry, hold on, I'm getting him. No, no, you're good. I, I totally uh, appreciate uh, you uh, talking to your son right now. And he wants some attention right now. We want your attention. He wants it all attention. happens. It's real life. And I need to <laughs> say something. I can't even think of, of what I was going to say. But truly what I was going what I was going to say is that um, they've already targeted, you know, our uh, our schools, our high schools, our elementaries, uh, or even like our libraries and our and our books. And so now they're even targeting uh, academia, you know, um, our doctoral programs, our graduate programs, our undergraduate programs. And so it's not going to stop because we know that these things are a threat to white supremacy. And so they're finding different avenues and different ways to target these ways of learning, these critical studies, um, because they don't want us to think critically. They don't want us to learn about certain history. They don't want us to be empowered by our own uh, stories and our own people. So I think that the work that we're doing here, the groundwork that we're doing here is really important in that fact that we are fighting towards like not only what happened 500 years ago, but what's happening presently and our right to um, to continue to be empowered by our people and what we have been like our legacy of what we've been creating, what we've been learning, what we, we've been uh, putting out there and sometimes have been destroyed and we are relearning and we are recreating. And that's one of the work that Danza Azteca's Dashkolo is really dedicated to is that not only learning our ancient ways and learning from our, our elders and our, and our ancestors, but also to create our own stories and to see what that looks like now presently. And that's really empowering for, for me and the, even the next generation to come. And, and I want to bring uh, Richard back in because I think, so there's a lot to talk about. We, we've tackled a lot of these different aspects in different radio programs, town halls, uh, as teachers of Mexican American studies. So I don't want to pretend to, to cram all of this into one moment. We do want folks to know that we are conducting the Libre Don't Forget the Caravan of Bam Books to Austin, Texas on Friday, April 29th. We have some of our partners here. Um, part of this will also be, like you said, let's just celebrate our own. We're not waiting for policies to erase us. We're not waiting for our programs to be chipped away. Um, we are driving from the mural of five Latina icons here in Houston, Texas at uh, Yolanda Black Navarro Middle School, and she's one of the icons. We're going to recognize five emerging Latina icons, including uh, Monica. And as we drive to Austin, we're going to recognize five Austin Latina icons because Austin should have its own mural of Latina icons, and these should be household names. Uh, Richard, that's part of your organization. Well, you know, you also do that by writing novels and, and getting the work out. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, the, the, the struggles and joys of creating different models in the system that, you know, seems to some days ignore us, other days, you know, want to ban us? Yeah. No, I know it's tricky. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of writers have, have written some really great essays about this kind of like you've kind of got a dual purpose if you're a writer of color. You know, like you 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 have to tell a good story, but you're also expected either like literally people tell you this or they imply it that you're expected to represent like all of your people and all of their experiences all at once, right? So um, so if you're writing a a, a book about people of color it's like well where's the immigrant struggle there's got to be an immigrant struggle mm -hmm. where's the where's the political struggle that's got to be there. and it's and it's tricky because sometimes you just want to write like a murder mystery or something or sometimes <laughs> you just want to write whatever like a um and sometimes you want to write that political thing so it's it's really easy to to kind of doubt yourself it's really easy to trip yourself up especially i think the most vulnerable time is when you're when you're an emerging writer, I think all writers always call themselves emerging writers. But when you're when you're really like taking the time to do it, and you're really working on stories, and you're getting feedback from people. Um, you have to be really strong to to deal with some of the. Well, I don't know if this 
character is educated enough to know that word kind of comments or the comments about like you know they're all mexicans but nobody's nobody's eating tacos in the story so you gotta like add so uh you have to figure out how to navigate all this yourself and it's hard it's really easy just to be like okay i'm just gonna go back to generic i'm not gonna describe anybody's culture we're all just gonna be people uh or any kind of other forms of self erasure it's really really hard you need to find a community um and you need to find some way to kind of believe in your own story which is which is tricky um i think i think for my own book i had two point of there are several point of view characters but the two main ones uh one is an anglo character and one is a latino in new mexico um and i think that part of the reason why my you know my my book had tried reached out to lots of agents i tried to do go with kind of like a larger publisher i think you they kind of had trouble sometimes knowing exactly where to slot my book um because it's it's a political book and it touches on some of these topics but not in ways that i think a lot of publishers were familiar with so i would have agents say i just don't know where this goes the mystery books the political books or the family book art the publico and other small presses uh, can take that risk. And that's kind of like the beauty of them. Well, and, and you mentioned that at the artistic level, then you also have that at the publishing level, because that's going through publishers' heads um, and the training of it. So it really is a, a challenge for our artists, our writers, to have the intelligence, tenacity, and wisdom to, to, to listen. Hey, okay, you know, maybe this character can be refined this way. But then also respect our own voices. Yeah, those are some. Yeah, good it's tricky. Yeah. And it's that confidence starts at a young age. Like it's it's showing kids their stories. It's helping them write their stories. It's, it's treating their work with respect. That's powerful. I tell you what, I want to touch bases on the graphic arts side as well as more on the indigenous experience, but. Let me tell folks what to expect on Friday, April 29th. And I do want to point something out. We're not going to repeat what we did on the 2012 Libra Tafi Caravan for many reasons, um, including that I firmly believe that the folks that want to silence us have studied the success of the Libra Tafi movement, the ethnic studies movement, and the Black Lives Matter movement to come up with these different ways to get the books out of our community's hands. So we're changing things up. This is a one-day caravan. And at 10 a.m., we will have a press conference at Yolanda Black Navarro Middle School. The five icon, Latina icons on that mural include Gracie Sines, who's a dear friend, uh, the matriarch of the Morales family, the uh, wonderful singer from the Santano family. Um, we also um, have on there uh, a figure who's, stu who's still... Uh, alive now and um she is actually uh the founder of a folklorico organization nelly fraga but among the the five icon emerging icons that we'll be naming are monica Villarreal, dr stalina Villarreal, liana lopez dr samantha rodriguez and dr chris trevino from there we'll be departing at the same time as from the guadalupe cultural arts centers uh, parking lot, a bus will be leaving. I do want to mention our other partners. This is in conjunction with LULAC state level. So this is the state LULAC sponsoring the buses. And the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center is also one of our partners. The director, uh, Cristina Bailly, will be joining us on the caravan as well. We hope to have uh, Rodolfo Rosales Jr. Uh, on one of our future programs talking about what's going on in San Antonio. But we have a lot of students from Trinity University, uh, getting on the bus as well. And we'll be driving straight to Palm Elementary, uh, Palm Park, which is 200 North Interstate 35, the service road. And I'm reminding you that at one point in Austin, Mexican Americans could not use the Anglo Library. We're gonna mark that occasion by launching our underground library at that site. And what we want people to understand is that our community is resilient. We've defied those days. We're thriving now, but our community must always have access to our books and culture. 
If you go to libertafricante.com, you can see this full schedule. From there, we're going to have this awesome procession. The bus from Houston, the bus from San Antonio, the Batmobile, <laughs> other folks in cars on the way to the Capitol. At the Capitol, we hope to get to around 2 or 3 p.m., we're going to have Teatro. Teatro Lucha is going to be doing theater uh, of the oppressed. We'll have music, poetry, banned books, people donating books. You know, there's some stuff that happened in history that we have to look straight in the eye. It ain't pretty. But I think our resilience is wonderful. And I think to celebrate our communities coming together. Um, Monica, anything to add about why it might be important to extol Latinas in particular and maybe join the Latina icons from Houston with Austin? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mention anything about the mural. <laughs> that was the original question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely important to be able to see people that look like you on huge murals. Um, it's in inspirational and it makes you feel capable. You know, um, other brown little girls will see that and be, you know, like, uh, wondering why they're up there and learn, hopefully learn more of these stories that are these really great contributions that they've made to this city. And so, I mean, that's always really important to be able to, you know, have um, uh, people that look like you, um, you know, put up, either learn their stories or put up in, you know, huge murals um, and representation matters. And so, um uh, I think that that's like the biggest message from that mural for me, at least, and to be able to even myself to be a, a voice for other people that look like myself uh, is, is really important. I love that. And uh, Richard, also, just so you know, what we're hoping to do is long term, we want to kick off a Nuestra Palabra chapter in, in Austin. Um, what that means we're going to see. We don't want to impose. We don't want to compete. We want to bring together. But more than anything, Nuestra Palabra turns 25 next year. What I hope is that between all our endeavors, next year we're having a fly show like this, multi-platform with poets from Austin, Houston, El Paso, Tucson, Los Angeles, Chicago, all celebrating what we do. And when folks come down to Austin, they go to the back cave. They look for the Batmobile in different places. And these community underground libraries, they can be anything the community wants. It's It doesn't go against libraries. We're, we're a literary nonprofit, but it goes to what the community wants and how it grows. Um, Richard, how can we help you in the long term? I mean, we, we want this to be where we're kicking off a great relationship and you can count on books coming from Houston to you from now on. Oh, I mean, we're so excited about the books. We're gonna we're gonna give away the books to students that are that are for students. When we get books that are for adults, we'll give them away to. Uh, we we have a we have a vibrant adult program as well that we that we use. We're gonna announce some summer events coming up pretty soon. We're also gonna start just taking the bus to different parks, and then show up and see if we can give away a couple boxes of books um, or farmers markets or who knows, right? It's Austin, so there's a farmers market on every corner. Um, <laughs> But yeah, if, if people go to austinbatcave.org, they can learn about our programs. Um, if you're in the Austin area this summer, our summer camps just opened up for registration. They're going to be in person. Um, send send your students to come like do some writing with us. Of course, like we're we're a small nonprofit. Some donations to help us keep the literally keep keep gas on the bus would always be helpful as well. Um, but yeah, find us on on social media or check out our website. And then when when I post some of the uh, the adult stuff, and maybe we should we could do we can do an event up in Houston too. Um, then uh, yeah, definitely try to check that out. I would love that. And actually, I, I mean, I want to make clear that we're also uniting all three cities. We have the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, where folks have been donating some books that they buy at the Latino Bookstore, and then they want to send to Austin's Underground Library. We also have an Underground Library in. San Antonio, but you just kind of mentioned it. Uh, we're Libra Taficantes, we're, we're, we're border <laughs> busters, and there's invisible fences between Austin, Houston, and San Antonio, and that should not be the case. Um, you, you know, Monica, you are the Nuestra Palabra representative for City Council B. Um, people don't typically imagine Latinos in City Council B because it's a historically African American neighborhood. Tell folks a little bit about the Latino presence in in your area. 
Um, it's, uh, it's primarily, this neighborhood is primarily black and, and brown. There are, uh, in every side of my, like uh, my neighbors, uh, my next door neighbors, he's a black uh, man. Uh, the one in front of me is a black man. And then there's a Latina family on the left and a Latino family on the right. And then the only um, uh, brand new bricked home in my in my street is owned by a white man. And so it's just um, pretty prevalent of like what city gas is built out of. You know, it's historically a, a black community, a black African-American community. Um, and, but now it's a very mixed, um, but it's a lot more Latinos and Blacks than there are any other um, people here in this neighborhood. And what I would add is that in Houston, every city council district is Latino. The, the lowest representation is in city council G at 20%. But think about that. In the lowest uh, area, the lowest number of Latinos uh, prevalent in one area, we're still one in five of resident, uh, residents and counting. The, the other reason I bring it up too is because I want to make something clear too um, because we should be very intentional. This chapter is a blatantly BIPOC chapter. Nuestra palabra, Libre Traficantes, we've always been about the BIPOC experience, Black, Indigenous, people of color. We've always uh, you know, united with African-American writers, Asian-American writers, Indigenous writers. We didn't say it directly because it's just obvious to us in this era where some of these book bands are going after the BIPOC rainbow, we need to mention that clearly. I also want to point out, we also support our LGBTQ uh, familia because they are being directly attacked. Um, and, and one thing I will mention as well is um, there's several lists of books that are people going after. There's Texas representative Krausman who came up with a list of 800 books that, uh, he said needed to be uh, addressed. Um, I call that banned from books. There's several Chicanas, Chicanos on that list. If you go through that list, if any book that had Black Lives Matter in the title was on that list, but also some of our friends, uh, Gloria Velasquez, her book, Tommy Stands Alone. Um, it's not, there's nothing bad about that book. It's about a, a young man that's asking some serious questions. I can't believe that that book's on that list also because I know Gloria. Uh, Rigoberto Gonzalez, uh, Mariposa Boy, his book, his book is on there as well. So I do want folks to know that we're bringing Rigoberto. Of course, we got to bring Rigoberto now to Texas since he's on that list. So he'll, he'll be here in Houston on, uh, on May 14th. Um, but, you know, in, in closing, uh, I, I do want to point out that policy and that there are specific tactics to attack the BIPOC community with some of these uh, attacks on books. As Libertaficantes, we've been plural before there was a word for it. So I just want to say that intentionally. But at the same time, we are celebrating art, literature, and, and culture. So, uh, you know, we've got a new family member, uh, Richard, uh, in the form of the Bat Cave. So glad that you've leaned in and you're so generous with your brilliance. And uh, we look forward to bringing you to Houston, bringing the Batmobile to Houston. I uh, look forward to celebrating your book as well. Uh, any, any party thoughts to some of your new familia in Houston as well as uh, San Antonio? Yeah, no, they, um, it's just so exciting to see people come together uh, and it makes a difference. Like these kinds of activities make a difference. They inspire people. They let people know that we're serious. Um, and it's, it's, it's so tempting to just to fall into like the doom on Twitter and just be like, oh man, this is awful. Or just kind of retweet something that's end with it. But like, no, get some, get some books, get some stuff out in people's hands. Um, it, they're like little, they're like seeds. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Like you don't know where it'll go. You don't know where it'll end up. But um, but all sorts of stuff can happen. So thank you. No, that that's beautiful. Uh, Monica, uh, any, anything to add? Any parting words to to bolster us for this next phase of this movement? Because we're in it for the long haul, for decades. <laughs> I'm just looking forward to um, upcoming events to talk about these issues because they're important to our community um, locally and, you know, nationally. Um, so uh, I'm just looking forward to it.
Saluda, dile que saluda. <laughs> Oh, That's awesome. Hi. Come see hey, hi, hi. hey I, I saw you in your regalia. You're a very good danzante. Did you know you're so good at it? Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> said, my yeah. tubby didn't hurt today. He was just telling me his tubby hurt, tummy hurts. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to, to chat with us. Thanks for all that you do in the community. And uh, I do want to give a shout out to to some of our other community members uh, who are joining in. Um, the YWCA of Greater Austin, they have really leaned in their support profoundly. They've also got their Houston chapters on board. So thank you, YWCA. Uh, vota y habla. Vota, habla y vota. Paul Saldana and, Lil, and Lily, they've leaned in heavily to help us out. We really appreciate their support. And uh, Vota and Habla gets a lot of work done. We're including them in some of our email blasts so that folks who are out in Austin can get involved with them as well. We really appreciate them as sponsors. Uh, La Peña also, well, they'll be facilitating the Underground Library. Uh, Resistencia Bookstore, of course, and Book Women. We want people to support independent presses, buy the banned books there, and then donate them to the Underground Libraries. And... Hey, we're, we're going to co-op the tactics of the corporate booksellers. There's more than one corporate bookstore in the cities. They're just not in our neighborhoods. That's why there are book deserts in our neighborhoods. We want to start many underground libraries. And a shout out to all the librarians. We love librarians. This in no way, shape, or form is meant to supplant the work that they do. But as we can see right now, there are forces that want to bully and intimidate librarians, libraries, school boards. And right now they are really flexing that muscle. We want to show a lot of love for our librarians, school board members. But we also want our community to know that we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that our communities have access to our stories, our books. And I'm going to close by this. If you really want to defy these bands, Start writing your story today. And I literally mean on a napkin, a paragraph, and start reading some of those books and start a family library. Hey, Richard, Monica, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Shout out to Roxana Guzman for producing the show. Shout out to Rodrigo Bravo and to all the Libra Tapicantes. Roxana, thank you so much for all that you do, all the great graphics and all the great spirit you bring. Uh, no, thank you, Tony, and uh, nice meeting you, Richard and Monica. Happy to help. Nice meeting you. Fantastic. Thanks. That's all for now. We'll talk to you next time. Gracias. Thank you.